Hello, my name is Michael Albert, and I'm an artist and an author, and this is my book. It's called An Artist's America, and it was published by a company called Henry Holt and Company in 2008, and I am going to read it to you and tell you a little bit about it. So this is an artist's autobiography, which means it's a book about me and I wrote it. And ever since it came out, I've developed this traveling art program where I go around to different places like schools, libraries, museums, art festivals, and I talk about my work. I show different examples of my work and then I run art workshops where I make art with people. And this summer, because of the unusual circumstances, 2020, um, there's not going to be any in-person programming. So I've recorded some video demonstrations of some of my projects. And I thought that I would do a video reading of my book so that people could find out a little bit more about me um, see some different examples of my work, and then if they wanted to try one of my projects, they could view one of the video demonstrations um, on the library websites. I think some are going to be posted on YouTube um, and other formats. But um, so I'll tell you about my book and read it to you. Ready? Well, here goes. First of all, this is the cover of my book, and originally. As an artist, I created an artwork which was supposed to be uh, my idea for the cover, and this is it. And the publisher decided that it was a little too busy and hard to read, which maybe some of my work is. Um, but they decided to take the letters that I had cut out as part of this artwork and use it to create their own cover. So you could see here, they took the letters from this original work that I made and superimposed the letters in black over another artwork that's featured in my book. And this was the cover. And it worked out well because the book was uh, well received and we sold a good amount of copies. And it ended up in libraries all around the country. And I've been traveling around the United States, visiting libraries and doing summer reading art programs um, at many library branches. And it's been great. And hopefully soon enough, we'll get back to that. But in the meantime, I'm gonna read you my book. So first there's the dedication and I wanted to just read the dedication to you. Um, this book is dedicated to my country, the United States of America, my parents, Larry and Wendy Albert, my brothers, David and Douglas, I'm the middle, my wife and best friend, Erin, our children, Lucy, Mary, John, and Jane, and America's children of all ages, who I hope will be inspired to create and follow their own ideas of the American dream. I also would like to thank my friend, John Fernandez, whose support and encouragement are immeasurable. And he's a friend of mine who um, had a printing business and we made uh, many prints of my artworks, some of which I'm going to show you uh, wh while I read the book and talk about different examples of my work. But we worked together for over 15 years, and he was a real mentor to me. And so I wanted to uh, include him in my dedication. So I'm going to start out with the introduction. And I do have some of the original artworks featured in my book that I'm going to show you while I read this. In the beginning, I started drawing. 
I would draw on anything, even an air sickness bag. That's what this drawing is made on an air sickness bag. If you don't know, an air sickness bag is a white bag that they have on airplanes that's in the little pouch right in front of your seat. And if you feel like you're gonna throw up, vomit, you take the bag and open it and vomit into the bag. And then you can close it up with the flaps. And um, that way you don't vomit all over the plane and all over yourself and all over the person sitting next to you. And that sounds kind of gross, but it happens. But I think most of the time people don't vomit on planes and the white bags just sit there. And so I actually made a drawing on a bag. I'll show it to you. I have the original right here. So this is the air sickness bag, original drawing that I made. And just the, just this side of the bag is featured in my book. Here it is. But, and what it is, is it's a view of New York City from where I grew up. And I can see right here, I'm at the airport down here. And in the distance is New York City. And this was done in 1987, when I was about 21 years old. This is drawn with, uh, I sketched it out in a pen, with a pen, and then I colored it in with magic markers. And you could see it's a sunset over New York City. And you could see over here are the Twin Towers, because the Twin Towers were still standing back in 1987. And I flew, I was on a plane flying to go visit my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, but I flew from Kennedy Airport, JFK Airport in New York, which is right near where I grew up. So one of the reasons I started out with this as the first image in my book was because I wanted to say that this is where I'm from. This is where I grew up. And I grew up in a town called Woodmere on Long Island and I went to uh, Lawrence High School, which you can see New York City from this view right from our field. So I also drew on the back and the bottom, not the, not the insides, but so I kind of made an artwork out of an air sickness bag. And you can see these are the flaps that if you vomit inside the bag, uh, you close it up and seal it so the vomit doesn't spill out. Um, I'll, fin I'll continue reading. So I was saying I would draw on anything, even an air sickness bag. First, I doodled with pen and ink, number two pencils, colored pencils, magic markers, crayons, and eventually I experimented with wax oil crayons. This is while I was still in college studying business at New York University. I visited museums such as the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Museum of Modern Art and looked at art that inspired me. At the time, I particularly loved the work of Vincent van Gogh, Henri Matisse, Paul Cezanne, Claude Monet, Edward Vuillard, Paul Gauguin, Gustav Klimt, Amedo Modigliani, Georges Seurat, and Pablo Picasso. There were many excellent examples of these artists' work at New York City museums. And I've always been inspired by seeing great art. For some reason, when I see great art at museums like by those artists I just named, um, it makes me wanna go home and make my own art. And I talked about these wax oil crayons that I used. This was the set of wax oil crayons that I got back then. The brand is called Caran Dash. And well, these have been used, but There's about 30 different colors, and they're very vibrant. And 
they're they are very smooth the color that you that comes out of them when you press it and make drawings and it doesn't chip off like regular crayons do you know like when you draw with regular crayons there's like little pieces that you have to kind of wipe off there this doesn't really happen with this kind of wax oil crayon um, but but they're easy to use kind of like a crayon so the next piece I'm going to talk to you about is a drawing that I made in college with those wax oil drawings and it's called the victim and it's a self portrait it's a picture of me on my bed if you look over here whoops my legs are over here and these are my hands whoops sorry and well i actually have a larger example of this artwork which i'm going to show you right now because this was a drawing that was pretty big this is a poster but this is the actual size of this drawing that i made and I included this in my book because to me, this was one of the first drawings that I considered a serious effort. I took over a month to create this. You can see here are my legs and here are my hands. And it's like I'm sitting on my bed drawing all the different things that were in my apartment when I was in college. And it's a self-portrait because it's a portrait of me and my stuff, although it's not a picture of my face. And I'll read you the uh, blurb that I wrote about this piece called The Victim. The Victim. I attempted to make art in my own style. This drawing is actually a montage of all the brands and other personal items I found in my dorm room. I put myself in the foreground of the drawing as Henry Matisse did in some of his sketches. And I called it the victim because I felt like I was the victim of advertising and marketing. Many of the collages I've made over the years have a similar look and feel to this early wax oil drawing. After I spent an entire month creating this drawing and filled in all the space, I looked and I saw that I had all these different brands in my apartment. And I thought, wow, I really must be a victim of advertising to uh, have all these different brand names of things. And that's why I called it the victim. And you could even see down here, I'm writing the word, the victim, can you see? And when I look at this, I made this now 30, 33 years ago. Um, I remember what my life was like back then and the different things I used. And, um, and it's, it's amazing to remember back then. And art really helps you to remember sometimes. So that was uh, the victim. Now the next artwork in my book is a, another wax oil drawing that I made. And this was on a theme of faces. And you can see, uh, I used the colors and made a very colorful drawing of all different faces, different sizes and expressions and all filled in with different colors in a different way. And I'll read it to you. The Faces series became, began as simple doodles in pen, pencil, marker, and many combinations therein. I enjoy drawing portraits, prefacing that the only thing I'm sure of is that the drawing will not look identical to the person. My drawings are more like uh, caricatures, but more like serious caricatures though. I don't exaggerate features and stuff like traditional caricatures. My faces often turned out expressive and revealing of human emotion in an abstract sense. I soon began creating full color compositions of this theme. I also started to title many of the pieces. And I think a good title can make a work of art even more interesting because it gives you something more to think about while you're looking at it. And so this drawing is actually called 
pain of the weight of the world. It's an imposing title for a colorful drawing like this. Now, the next two-page spread is about a brand that I created called Surreal. And these are my own characters that I created. And I guess what I want to start to tell you before I read this is that I did not go to art school. I'm what you would call uh, self-taught. And I think art is one of those things that you can teach yourself. You know, it's great to be able to take classes and art lessons. And if you can go to art school, that's great if that's what you want to do. But the way that we really learn about making art, I think, is by sitting down and making stuff. And the more you experiment with different materials and the more you do it, the more you practice, the more you develop your own style. And I think very often the better you get. And you, you'll see a progression in your own work. But the, but the thing you have to do is to do it, to keep doing it. And um, you're going to see as I read my book to you that I've went through a progression myself from drawing into collage and that um, I developed different themes and my art really kind of evolved through that process. The only way for that to happen is to continue doing it and um, spending time and effort and, and it should develop for you, for anybody that, that sits down and does it. Um, but so I went to business school. I went to NYU, a college in New York City called, uh, otherwise known as New York University. And my major was business. And so I didn't study art formally. But like I said earlier, I started going to museums. New York City's got some of the best museums in the world. And the Metropolitan Museum was really my favorite because, mostly because it was free to go to but also because it's got art from all different periods in, in history, from prehistoric times and ancient Greece and Rome and Egypt and other cultures, all the way up to the modern times. And like I was saying, I really love the Impressionist and Post-Impressionist periods and modern art with artists like Vincent van Gogh and Monet and Cezanne and Picasso and all the other guys I mentioned. Um, some, girl, some girl artists I love too, Georgia O'Keeffe, Louise Nevelson. Um, uh, there's a lot of artists that I love. And um, anyway, so like I said, I was a business student and art was something I started doing on my own, just for my own enjoyment. And when I got out of school, I ended up getting into food sales. I became a food salesman. And eventually I had an idea to create my own label, my own brand, and I used my art to do that. And I have a little bit of information about these characters I created. It was originally for a line of fruit juices, and you can see I made an apple character, a lemon character, and a tangerine character. And, um, well, I'll read it to you first. <sighs> Surreal. Surreal is an art concept and series of cartoon-like characters that parody the modern art movement of surrealism. I created this series when I realized the necessity and value of developing my own merchandising brand for my natural food distribution business. Today, I make and sell organic fruit juices that feature these characters on the bottle labels. The red apple man is on the label of organic apple cider. The lemon man and the tangerine man are labels of lemonade and tangerine juice. These characters wear bowler hats and tuxedos because of the brand's motto, life is a formal occasion. 
The surreal slogan is I have a dream, or in other words, do what you love. And its creed is do the right thing, which is what I try to do, the right thing that is, in both my personal and professional life. Easier said than done. These are ideas that I believe are worth thinking about and promoting. So for me, it was a great opportunity to use my art, use my wax oil crayons to create these characters for my labels. And I still do that today. I have one of my products here. This is my applesauce with the apple man on there. And like I said, the brand is called Surreal. And it's in some stores in the New York area. And maybe one day it'll be in stores around the country. But uh, it was just a way of me using my art in my business. And I draw those characters quite often. I love drawing those characters. Sometimes I do festivals where I'll draw those characters and outline for people and they'll color them in. And that's fun. Um, and I'm also making a video demonstration of how to draw those characters yourself. So look for that. So that's, that's about surreal. Now I'm going to talk to you about collages. The collages. Taking recycling to a higher plane. And the first example of my collages is a photograph collage of the Empire State Building in New York City. So I'll read it to you. Let's see. I created collages as a way to recycle certain paper products I had accumulated at work and home. I had been making mostly drawings, and then I started experimenting with different materials. First, I began using stickers, photographs, and old labels from my juice business, where I would cut them into pieces and arrange them on cardboard. I started making photo collage portraits of family and friends, and then other subjects. This collage of the Empire State Building was made from a postcard that I cut into strips, rectangular slivers, and then rearranged to form my own composition. It is a cubist portrait of one of the world's most famous buildings. I created this artwork for an exhibit I had on the ground level of the Empire State Building. I thought it was a terrific venue for pop art being a major tourist attraction in New York City. And I always thought it was very interesting that even though I had cut up the postcard into pieces and put it back together in my own way, that you could still tell that it's the Empire State Building. And some people say that it looks like it's made out of many different photographs, but it's actually just one small postcard cut up and put back together again. And my earlier photos were all the extra photos I had at home, um, mostly pictures of my family, because um, many of us who uh, used to take pictures with film, we would then go to the store and get our pictures developed. And a lot of times the pictures weren't so good or we had duplicates. And um, rather than just save them and never look at them again or throw them out, um, I decided to start using them and make art with them. And that's what led me to making stuff like this. The next page I'm going to talk about is my American flag. And um, I'll read it to you first. But this is an interesting one because you can see the flag here pictured in my book is a pretty good size. I have a poster of it here, which is even bigger, the same image printed as a poster, which is even bigger. And then I have the original collage I made, which is right here. And this is the actual size of it. So look how small it is. And it's a signed work. I called it the Americas flag, and it was done on May 8th, 1999. 
at 9.29 p.m. And this is my little squiggle that I made up that I put on most of my artworks. But it's interesting to see the original collage next to a poster like this, which isn't really that big. And this is a good illustration of how sometimes my artworks are very small and sometimes they're very large. And by looking at it in a book, looking at, at the art image in a book, it's hard to uh, guess what the original size is. Like, I don't know if you looked at this picture in my book that you would think that the original was small like that. So I'll read you the part about the flag. Okay. The flag is a classic theme in pop art made famous in the 1950s by Jasper Johns. My flags are also inspired by Betsy Ross, whose hand-sewn flags were made from cut pieces of colored cloth. My first flag collages were created from United States Postal Service priority mail stickers that I cut and pasted onto pieces of cardboard. And later, after I had been working with cereal boxes and other consumer packages, I started making flags out of the red, white, and blue packaging. In all, I have created over 300 renditions of this classic American theme. In this particular flag, the red pieces came from a Coca-Cola 12-pack carton, and the blue pieces came from a Frosted Flakes cereal box. Can you tell that this red is the same red as Coca-Cola, and that this blue is the same blue from a Frosted Flakes cereal box? Now I'm gonna to get to the section about my cereal box art which by the way, I think if I'm known at all as an artist, I'm known mostly for making art out of cereal boxes. And so here is the first collage I ever made out of a cereal box. It's a Frosted Flakes box, all cut up into pieces and put back together in my own way. So I'll read you the part about the cereal box art. I call the cereal box art serialism because um, it was just sort of a funny name I came up with after I had started making art out of cereal boxes and it stuck. A lot of times different art movements are named by critics uh, or people in the press and they kind of make up a, a funny name and it sticks. And so I decided to make up my own for my own work. And, um, okay. Serialism and the Pop Cubist Portraits. Frosted Flakes, Portrait of an American Classic. I began using consumer packaging such as cereal, cookie, and tea boxes. After I created an abstract cereal box collage out of a Frosted Flakes box, I made a series of pop cubist portraits of popular consumer brands. I called the cereal boxes serialism and also created portraits of other classic American brands and iconic images. I deconstructed the cover by cutting it into many small pieces and then reconstructed it. After mixing up the elements, I found it fascinating that the original image was almost instantly recognizable. This is the first collage I ever made using a cereal box cover. I have created over 500 different cereal box collages since this. And the next few pages just show um, some more examples of some of my cereal box art because to me these were very important to me and my work. Maybe this will be a better way to show it to you. So these two collages were both made out of Cheerios boxes, which is one of my favorite cereals. Cheerios. 
This is the only product I could think of that babies eat as their first food and adults continue eating throughout their lives. The Cheerio box is also one of the most familiar icons in the supermarket brandscape. No matter how I reconstructed the box cover, it was obviously Cheerios. Can you tell? This is the classic. This one here is called the boardwalk effect because I cut the box into strips and then I cut the strips into slivers and laid them down one by one, carefully gluing them. And, um, and it felt like I was putting down a wooden floor or a boardwalk. And, uh, and this other one is cut into all different triangular shapes. I call that random angles. And I've made about 75 original Cheerio boxes. Here's a couple of others of my favorites. Trix and Captain Crunch. After creating my first group of individual cereal box collages, I decided to take three or four of the same box and make a master serialist portrait in a larger format. This, tr this Trix portrait is one in those series. You could see if you look at the Trix bunny that he's got six eyes. That's because I cut up three of the same box and glued them all down onto a larger board. But all the others are made out of just one box. So this Captain Crunch Berries was just one box. Captain Crunch Berries. As I developed the Serialism series, I started experimenting with a variety of shapes, such as the swirl in this Captain Crunch collage. See? And then I have a couple of examples of other products besides cereal that I uh, created collages in this same kind of a way. Cracker Jack. Besides cereal boxes, I also tried to capture many other classic brands. Cracker Jack featuring a snack food offered at baseball games is one of my sports related works. I made this one from an actual Cracker Jack box, which is hard to find now that the box has been replaced by a printed cellophane bag. The Cracker Jack boxes were one of the most classic things, and I think they're the original snack food. Um, they're probably made a hundred years ago. And then Campbell's Soup. Campbell's Soup, this collage was actually made out of a Campbell's Soup label, not a box but I felt um, that I really wanted to include this in my book because um, there's a famous pop artist named Andy Warhol who became famous for making silkscreen paintings of Campbell soup cans. So as a homage to him, I wanted to include my collage version of a Campbell soup label. So I'll read it to you. Many people have described my work as a cross between Andy Warhol's pop art and cubism. So in honor of Warhol and his most well-known subject, here is my portrait of the Campbell soup can label. You, I don't know, I, I haven't mentioned this, but one of the things I always do in my work is I put my initials as a way to sign my work. And if you look here, there's an M and an A. And I put my initials MA in almost all of my collages, which if you look carefully, you could find there's actually another MA down here. Can you see? If we look back over here at the Cracker Jack box, let's see if we could find an MA. Uh, oh yeah. Right over here. Can you see that? M A. So that's just one of the ways I sign my work on the front. I showed you on my other collage that I write on the back. I sign my name and I write the title of a work and I usually write the date. 
and I make that squiggle that I showed you. But on the front of my collages, I don't write on them. I kind of hide my initials somewhere. So now I'm going to show you two of my collages that I made out of actual money. And I know this seems crazy, but it was an experiment, and I don't do this too often, but I thought I was cutting up all these classic things like famous products and pictures of famous buildings like the Empire State Building, and I thought, what's more classic and well-known than money? And so I did a $1 bill, which has George Washington on it, and I did a $5 bill, which has Abraham Lincoln on it. Those are two of my favorite presidents. So I'll, I'll read this to you. I call these two portraits of Washington and Lincoln. Currency is perhaps the most well-known series of images in our world. No matter how much I dissect its virtual elements, it remains recognizable. I'm constantly asked if it's legal to make art for money. I thought this was a good example of the absurd situations we are often in. We can ruin our paper money accidentally running it through the wash, but when we take some bill, the same bill and make art out of it, people question our intent. Then again, I wouldn't recommend cutting up too much of your money. And uh, I don't do this very often. I only did a few and uh, I do think they look kind of cool. And you can see my MAs in there. Can you see my initials MA? Okay, so now we're getting on to another section. And all of those artworks that I just showed you, each one only used one product or one object for me. Um, and I cut them up and I made them into a collage. Most of the works I'm going to show you from now on include taking pieces from many different packages and putting them together to create um, artworks on different themes and ideas. So I call certain works that take me a really long time to make and a tremendous amount of effort to make. Um, epic works because for example the drawing that i showed you that took me a month to make um that was a you know a huge effort on my part i thought i never worked so hard on a project before and um so to me it was an epic uh creation so here's an example of one of my epic works and this is called The Last Breakfast. And it's a collection of characters. And then I took letters from many packages and cut out, um, spelled different messages. And this is my recreation of a famous scene, The Last Supper. But I did it uh, sort of in a silly way and called it The Last Breakfast. So I'll read you this. Make it so that you can look at it while I'm talking. Okay. Epic works. Over time, I started using entire boxes, not just the front panels, to make my collages and combined elements of many different boxes to create larger scale, more complex compositions. Sometimes I collected characters from the many different brands, at other times, logos, then letters and words. Some works combined all of these elements. So this is The Last Breakfast, and I'll tell you about that right now. The Last Breakfast. The epic works are my largest and most detailed pieces. They are epic in both subject matter and the amount of work it takes to make them, usually months, and even sometimes a year or more. I've recreated numerous episodes from the Bible and American history. What I especially love about being an artist is getting the chance to pick subjects I'm interested in, learning about them at my own pace, 
and then expressing what I've learned through art. I have depicted famous biblical and historical events, including the Last Supper, Judgment Day, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, the Statue of Liberty, the Pledge of Allegiance, and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And those artworks are all featured in this book. So you can see here that at the bottom over here is one of my surreal characters, and he's surrounded by the 12 apostles, representing the 12 apostles from famous characters from cereal boxes. And I cut out letters to spell messages such as do the right thing, love thy neighbor, try your best, and other important messages that I think um, make this a very serious artwork. The next collage I'm going to show you is called Judgment Day. And Judgment Day is a very large collage. At this point, when I made this, which was about in the year 2000, this is a 32 by 40 inch collage, and I spent a year making it. And my idea was to collect every possible character I could find on consumer brands and put them all together into one collage. And I'll read it to you. see it while I talk. Ready? Judgment Day. Of all the artworks I've created, Judgment Day took the longest. I worked on this collage for an entire year. Since no one escapes the final judgment, I felt every possible character I could find must be included. I obsessively searched for hundreds of different characters from the packages of consumer brands. I put my surreal characters in the foreground as the panel of judges and included 49 words throughout the composition, which I thought one might consider at the time of judgment. Can you see along the bottom my surreal fruit head characters? And some of the words that I included that I thought, if there is a time of judgment, that one might think about, such as charity, thoughtfulness, kindness, patience, respect, honor, understanding, important ideas like that. And again, I thought the idea of combining these characters from our consumer brands and an idea like this was a very interesting idea. By this time I had a lot of different packages in my studio, which was really just an area in my apartment. And I started making these big montages of logos from all different brands. I just thought it would look really cool to sort of cram together hundreds of label logos and to see them all together in one art form. Um, and I have a poster of this logo collage I'm gonna tell you about. I'll show it to you first. This is a poster which happens to be a lot smaller than the original. The original of this is probably four times bigger than this. A, and um, you can see it's all logos of brands of candy and gum, and it's all arranged in alphabetical order. Up top over here are all the brands that start with A, and then the B's and the C's and D's, and it kind of zigzags back and forth all the way to Z. And I called this a study, like a, a study in logos. And Etude 
is a word in French that means a study. And so here I'll read it to you. Study in candy logos A to Z. Etude is a study of logos and well-known candy brands. I chose to feature the candy in alphabetical order after making a collage in no particular order. That one drove me crazy because every time I tried to add a logo to the composition, I, find my, I found myself having to look at every piece that was already included to make sure I wasn't replicating it. I think this piece illustrates the incredible variety of choices we have here in America. And this collage etude was the centerpiece of an exhibition I had back in 2003 at a candy store in New York City called Dylan's Candy Bar. It's a very big candy store and I had met the owner and she thought it would be a good idea to have a exhibition of collages made out of candy packages. So you can see it's all arranged alphabetically. Now, I really loved putting the messages into that piece I showed you before called The Last Breakfast with the messages like do the right thing and try your best. And I had decided that I wanted to see if I could make a whole collage just out of words and messages. And this is the first artwork I ever made that was only words. And the title of it is You Know What They Say, because um, it's really a collection of phrases. And I found that a lot of people say, you know what they say, right before they say one of these phrases. So see, I'll let you see it nice and close. I don't know if you can read any of these messages. Some of them are, uh, let me see. Oh, actions speak louder than words. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Talk is cheap. Hindsight is 2020. Have you heard of any of these phrases? Anyway, I'll read you what I wrote about it. <clears throat> this composition is actually a collection of proverbs or cliches, words of wisdom that we hear all the time in our daily lives. The most highly detailed collage I've ever, I've created to this date. And this took me over three months to make. I really loved the idea of making an art out of words and messages because it's not only is it something interesting to look at, but it's something very interesting to think about. Um, the next one I'm gonna show you is my collage of Lincoln's famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. And I thought the Gettysburg Address <clears throat> was a great subject for art because it's so important and it's so well known. And I decided to just spell out the speech the same way that I had been cutting out letters from many different packages and, and making a collage out of it. So the Gettysburg Address, I was attracted to this subject simply because it's one of the most famous speeches in American history. The creation of this work and the sharing it with others encouraged my own in-depth study of the life of Lincoln and the Civil War. During the making of this piece, I memorize the address and often enjoy reciting it for others as they read along with the collage. And um, I'm not gonna recite it for you right now, but maybe one day I will, if we ever meet. And learning about this subject, um, you know, I, I recommend to everybody to learn about Abraham Lincoln and to read his speeches and story of his life and some of the letters that he wrote. He really left us a lot of wisdom to think about. 
And I wanted to show you the original size of the Gettysburg Address. I printed a, a poster of it. This is the actual size of this collage. I can hold it back. I can hold it up to the screen, but it'll, it's too big. It starts off famously, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Anyway, I strongly suggest learning more about Lincoln and the Gettysburg Address speech. And I think not only is it a beautiful speech with really important and deep meaning, but this collage almost looks like stained glass, even though it's uh, just made out of letters cut out from different consumer packages. Okay, what's next? Ooh, the Statue of Liberty. And when I say the Statue of Liberty, I'm talking about the poem that's on the Statue of Liberty called The New Colossus. And if you look here, after I had done the Gettysburg Address, I was inspired to try to make collages out of other famous words that I had learned about. And I found out that on the base of the Statue of Liberty is a very famous poem, and people know the line, um, give me your poor, your tired, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, but it's a, it's a whole poem, and I think most people don't know the entire poem. So I thought if I made an artwork of it and made it into a poster, people would have a chance to read the entire poem. Plus it would be fun and interesting to look at. So I'll read you what I have about this. This is my interpretation of the 14 line poem written by Emma Lazarus that appears on the base of the Statue of Liberty. I found that most people, including myself, generally only know, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses. And I often refer to this collage as my girl power piece because I have Lady Liberty down here as the central figure surrounded by her 12 female apostles represented by famous female characters from consumer brands. Here's Aunt Jemima, Here's the sun made raisins, girl, chicken of the sea, Morton salt, the mermaid from Starbucks, little Debbie. This is a character named Kay that was on Special K, and I don't think she's around anymore. And look, she's looking at a computer screen, and on the computer screen, I put my little surreal Apple man. Then here's Wonder Woman. This is from Joy Straws. And then here is the Land of Lakes girl from Land of Lakes Butter. And I don't know if you could see it, but down here is Swiss Miss, Hot Cocoa Mix, and then Blue Bonnet. So those are all famous female characters from consumer brands. And I had Lady Liberty as the main character. So that's why it's a girl power kind of a thing. And if you could see, uh, Lady Liberty is in black and white and everybody else is in full color. So I say here that I was inspired by the film, The Wizard of Oz. I created Lady Liberty in black and white like Kansas while everything else is in full color like in the land of Oz representing our technicolor world of consumerism. Have any of you seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz? If not, you should. It's great, the classic. Um, now here's another artwork idea that I had. And before I show you this, it's actually my, have you heard of Mount Rushmore? Mount Rushmore is the mountain out in South Dakota where they carved the head the heads of four of our greatest presidents. And my publisher's idea to call my book An Artist's America, the
the idea was that it was going to be an introduction to me as an artist, but it was also going to be, um, the idea was to show my vision of America through the art that I've made. So when I was writing the book and discussing it with my publisher, um, and my publisher's name was, is Christy Ottaviano. She's the one who I met who had the idea to do this book and who I worked on to get this book done. Um, when, when she had said that this, let's, let's focus on your vision of America through your art, I came up with a few other ideas of, that I thought were truly classic American things. And one of them was Mount Rushmore. So I'll read you what I have about Mount Rushmore. Okay, here, let's see. Okay. Blue pieces cut from a Rice Krispies box depict the sky. Can you tell that this is a Rice crispy blue? There's a line from the Star Spangled Banner embedded in the center. The land of the free and the home of the brave. Have you heard that? I chose these classic icons of pop consumer culture. Mr. Clean, the Quaker Oats Man, Captain Crunch, whoops, and Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken to represent the four presidents depicted on Mount Rushmore. Washington, Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Lincoln because they shared similar features. So actually, if you look close to this, I'll explain. I picked the Kentucky Fried Chicken, the Colonel from, whoops, I picked, sorry. I picked the Colonel, whoops. I picked the Colonel Sanders from Kentucky Fried Chicken because Actually, Abraham Lincoln was born in Kentucky. Then I picked Captain Crunch to represent Theodore Roosevelt because of his mustache. I thought he kind of looked like Teddy Roosevelt. Then George Wash, um, no, then Thomas Jefferson, I'm sorry, I thought kind of looked like this. If you've ever seen a picture of Thomas Jefferson. And then finally, Mr. Clean represents George Washington. Because I thought if you took off George Washington's wig and his three-corner hat, he might look like Mr. Clean. Okay, moving along. Now I'm going to talk about another very famous thing in American culture, the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'll just read it to you. Let's see. The Pledge of Allegiance. Before leading a workshop for kindergartners, I wanted a subject kids could easily recite. The Pledge of Allegiance seemed the perfect choice. I went back to my studio and spent more than a month creating this collage using images from hundreds of sources. And then I picked 50 brand icons to represent the 50 states and used as many widely recognizable brand typefaces as I could for the letters. And so this is the whole pledge. And the original's about is much bigger than this. It's smaller than the Gettysburg Address, but it's much bigger than the printed page. And you can see I picked logos from all different brands. Thomas's English Muffins, the Land of Lakes Lady, the Cracker Jack Kid, Tony, ooh, Tony the Tiger, Aunt Jemima, the Gerber Baby, and all these famous iconic images to represent the 50 states. And it was fun to do that. Now, I had met somebody who really loved math and was telling me all about this number that goes on forever called pi. Have you heard of pi, P-I? Well, pi starts out 3.14. And actually in a lot of schools, I think starting maybe in fifth grade, they start to 
celebrate what they call Pi Day on March 14th, 314. And you learn all about pie, and some teachers bring in pie or pizza pies, and they have math games. But pie is a very interesting number. It's an approximate number that goes on forever. And you'll definitely learn about it in school at some point. And when I heard about it, I had learned about it in school, but a little later on, I was talking to someone who was a graduate student in math, and they were really interested in pi and they knew all about it. And I thought to myself, you know, I've been using a lot of letters and logos and characters in my collages, but this would be an interesting subject for me to use the numbers that I see on packages. And so I created a pi collage. And since then I've made a whole bunch of different pi collages. So I'll read that to you now. Let's go back here. The number pi, the first 190 digits. After talking with a graduate student in mathematics about the number pi, I grew eager to create a mathematical collage. I saved numbers from packaging until I had a pile for my pi compositions. I looked up the first 10,000 digits of pi and taped it to the wall of my studio. I have done several versions of pi going out as far as 277 digits, but this one features seven words hinting at abstract ideas hidden within the patterns of numbers. This was done in a square shape, 10 by 10 inches, and can you see some of the words in there? Hope, love, infinity, life, peace, yes, and God. Also, can you see my initials right here, M-A? So actually my book came out in 2008. Since then, I created a Pi collage to 777 digits, which took me almost four years. So at the time I created this book, the declar the, the, uh, Judgment Day collage I showed you with all the characters had taken me a year. And so that was the artwork that had taken me the longest. But now I had created, um, by now I've created a pie collage that took four years. And I'm working on some new pieces that have taken me several years as well. Um, but the last artwork that's featured in my book is the signing of the Declaration of Independence. And this again is a famous episode in American history. And this collage is a collection of characters, words, and logos. And I'll read it to you. The signing of the Declaration of Independence. I also thought that this was a appropriate artwork to include as the last artwork in my book because the Declaration of Independence is considered by many to be the official beginning of the United States of America. When the, when the colonies sent the Declaration of Independence to King George III in England and said, we're gonna be our own country now, that on July 4th, 1776, really signified the beginning of our country. So I thought it would be interesting to finish my book with the beginning of our country. Um, so the signing of the Declaration of Independence. This epic work is the culmination of over six months of research. I was especially drawn to the document's poetic nature and historical significance. I picked key portions of the text to lead the viewer on a journey and selected 56 characters from our modern consumer world to represent the 56 statesmen who signed it. I also chose 13 classic brands to represent the original 13 colonies. The initials of all 56 statesmen are hidden in the composition and Samuel Adams, the statesman and brewer of beer is the only character who was actually present at the signing. 
here's Sam Adams. So he represents himself as one of the 56 signers and all these other characters represent the different men that signed the declaration. If you look closely along the bottom, the initials of all the different signers are hidden in there. I put my own characters, the surreal apple man, tangerine man and lemon man in there too, because they're gonna be icons of our consumer culture one day, I hope. Some of the brands I picked to represent the original brands, the colonies were Philadelphia cream cheese. And I put that right at the beginning because the Declaration of Independence was signed in Philadelphia. Um, Campbell Soup, Coke and Pepsi, Post Cereal, Kellogg's. So it's a real collection of iconic images, letters, characters, and logos from our world. So the last two pages talk about the workshops that I do and how to make a collage in your own style. Um, I'll read it to you. Workshops. Not too long after I started publicly showing my work in museums, galleries, and non-traditional venues, such as cafes and restaurants and stores, I began getting calls from teachers and parents asking if I would come to their schools and give workshops about collage making. Over the years, I've led many workshops and have found that people of all ages enjoy creating collages. These workshops set, shed light on the deeper issue of consumer waste. We learn that it's a good idea to take things that we already have lying around, like cereal boxes after we finish the cereal or old photographs we don't need anymore, and use it rather than just throw it away because there's too much garbage in the world as it is. So anything we can reuse is better than just throwing it into the garbage. Kids are empowered to recycle through art. The materials needed are abundant and free, as opposed to painting supplies, for example, which you have to go to the store to get and are expensive. The characters and typefaces associated with these packages make up a modern hieroglyphics that we see all the time, but they take on a whole new meaning when rearranged. Today, I continue to create new collages and give workshops to help foster an appreciation for art and a new generation of awareness regarding recycling. Through my art, I hope I can inspire others to do what they love and to express themselves in the process. So art was a thing for me that I really liked to do, and I realized that I could express myself by doing it. You might find something that you love to do, which enables you to express yourself, and it might not be art. It might be something else, or it might be art, but in some other form. I mean, that's up to you to, to figure out. And that's the fun. That's the fun of it all. And that's the beautiful thing that, that being uh, an American citizen affords us. It gives us the opportunity to come up with our own idea and work really hard to make it happen. So if you wanted to try to make a collage in your own style, I'll read you this section on that. And um, I've also recorded a few video demonstrations that you might find either on your library website or on YouTube. And um, they'll show you how to do some of these projects that I've told you about, you know, in a little bit more detail. But generally, how to make a collage in my style. To make collages from consumer packaging, you will need one, cardboard packaging of a consumer brand, such as a cereal box, tea box, or cookie package. Two, a glue stick, 
preferably clear paper glue with a sponge valve or regular Elmer's glue or store brand glue like Staples clear glue, but a regular glue stick is good too. Three, scissors. Most scissors can cut cardboard consumer packaging. Younger kids might need help cutting the boxes, but they can also tear them, which adds texture to the collage. I generally don't tear, but that doesn't mean you can't. Four, cardboard for a collage surface. I often con conduct workshops where the cardboard we work on is cut from the back of the box or some section of the box to make the artwork completely recycled, which is my concept in its purest sense. But you can also use like the back of a writing pad. Here's a pad and the back of it is a piece of cardboard, which you can take and make your collage on there. You could also take a box that's come, you know, a shipping box that something's come in, let's say delivered to your house, and cut a piece of the box and use that as your base. And then five, you need a workspace. You don't need a lot of space, but um, any table will do. And it's a good idea to use newspaper under your work or some other protection from the surface because you don't want to get glue on your nice table. And then time, the amount of time and effort that goes into your work will surely be evident in the result. Um, you know, doing, doing a good job at something takes time and effort and, um, you should be in no rush to make an artwork because the best thing you can do is to relax and let yourself think about what you want to do and, and then make something. And, uh, you know, if you're in a rush, then sometimes you're, you're not able to be as creative and enjoy the experience as much as you might want to. And then seven, a pen to sign and date your work. It's a great way to keep track of your progress. And it also shows that you take your work seriously. If you work hard and make something that you like and you're proud of, you could sign it on the back. You could sign your name. You could write the date. You could give the work a title. And that way you can keep track of your work. And if you really don't like it and you think it's terrible and you don't want to look at it ever again, you could throw it back into the recycling bin and try it, try it again. That's the beauty of it. The very last page is the art credits, which lists every artwork in my book, and it tells when it was made and the size of it and where it is. Some of them are in private collections. Some of them I still own. And then the, the flap of the book has a little bit about me. Maybe I should have read this first, but I'll read it to you now. Michael Albert is a pop artist whose signature collages have been exhibited in both galleries and non-traditional venues. He is also the founder of Surreal, a brand of organic fruit juices, which are distributed nationwide. Michael Albert conducts workshops on collage making at schools, museums, and special events for students of all ages. He lives with his wife and four children in White Plains, New York. Um, actually, my oldest daughter is married and lives in Slovenia. And my second oldest daughter moved out into her own apartment. Um, but I do still live with my wife and two of my kids in White Plains, New York. And uh, and the back of the book again shows my Frosted Flakes box which to me was the very beginning of my pop art. It's the first time that I used a package to make an artwork out of it and to take something that would otherwise be thrown into the trash and turn it into art. And they picked out this line from my book, um, young people of all ages, which I really mean to be all people, people of all ages, uh, if, you're, if you 
let yourself be creative and have fun, you're young, young at heart. So that's what I mean by young people of all ages are empowered to recycle through art and the materials needed are abundant and free. The characters and typefaces associated with these packages make up a modern hieroglyphics that we see all the time, but they take on a whole new meaning when rearranged. And we assign that meaning, meaning to the different things we see. So that's my book, An Artist's America. And you, you could look for it in your library. Um, one thing you could do is go to your library's website and they have a little search um, thing where you type in the title of the book, An Artist's America, and you'll see if the library has it. And maybe you can take a look at it um, in person. Uh, there's also, it's out of print now, actually. Um, we sold, I think we sold about 10,000 copies and they went to libraries and people bought them all over the country and Canada. And then they decided to make it an ebook. And I decided that um, I was going to get the rights to my book back. And what I've been doing for the last few years is working on expanding it. I've been adding different examples of art that I've made ever since the book came out. Since the book came out in 2008, um, I've been making art for over 10 years since then. So I've come up with some other new ideas. And so I wanted to expand the book and add some of the artworks I've made lately. And I've also written some essays about why I make art and what I think about art and some of the pieces that I've made. So I'm hoping to have a chance to uh, come out with an expanded version of this at some point. But in the meantime, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. I appreciate you uh, spending some time with me today. And uh, I wish you all uh, good luck and success in finding your own dream, finding something that you are interested in and working hard at it to make it happen. And keep me posted. I have a website, it's just my name, michaelalbert.com. You could send me a message if you like. There's a space to join a newsletter. Once a month I send out a newsletter about things I'm doing and places I'm gonna be. Maybe I'll come to your area sometime soon. I hope so. Another thing you could do is visit my Pinterest. And Pinterest is a tool that I found that's very helpful. Um, I post all different examples of my art and I organize them by types of um, themes that I've worked on. For example, I have one section that's all American flags. And I have another section that's all cereal box collages. And then I have another section that's all made out of words and quotes. So this is the address. You can pause this video and copy it down and see many examples of my work if you like. And um, I hope you use your local library because uh, the same way that I've been making art and learning about different things on my own, the library is one of the best places you could possibly go to um, to learn anything you want to learn on almost any subject. And librarians are there for you to help you uh, find materials on whatever it is you, you want to know. And they're kind of like teachers to the world. And they're there for you. And the library, there's a library in every community. And they're free to go to. And soon enough, they'll be open again for the public. And we'll continue our quest together to find the American dream. So take care. And thanks so much again for listening. Bye. Let's see.